Okay, welcome back. This is lecture six. Now the first part of lecture six we're going to focus in on chapter 12, the eukaryotic members of the microbial world. Uh, this is very important because up to this point we've been spending a lot of time with uh, prokaryotes, bacteria, archaea, mostly bacteria. But now what we've got to do, especially since we're doing this for healthcare providers, is we've got to look at the eukaryotic members, those that have nucleus, of the microbial world. Now the second part of this uh, lecture will also focus on um, chapter 13, which includes, includes bacteriophages, viruses, viroids, and prions. So hang on, it's going to be quite an interesting ride. First, of course, I would tell you to review the key terms for this particular section, as well as the glimpse of history. Okay. And a lot of times we don't appreciate until far later in history or have an, uh, an understanding of how some things can affect our lives. It's one thing to have a disease that infects the humans. It's another thing that a disease occurs and wipes out your entire food supply and the consequences of starvation and nutritional deficiencies, etc., were endemic as well as death by starvation uh, in the time of the Irish famine, which I encourage you to take some time to read. Okay, when we talk about eukaryotes, these are members of a form of life that have a membrane-bound nucleus, which of course contains the genetic material DNA. And what you have there are red blood cells. Well, red blood cells don't have a nucleus, that's true. But inside of them happen to be a parasite, a protozoan that happens to cause malaria. And those protozoans do have a uh, nucleus. Eukaryotes are well known for having not merely a membrane-bound nucleus, but also membrane-bound organelles, such as uh, the mitochondria, uh, endoplasmic retic uh, reticulums, both uh, smooth and uh, rough, Golgi apparatus, etc. Excuse me. Now, the features uh, that allow for cell specialization, these, these particular unique capabilities allow for cell specialization, greater efficiency of biochemical processes, and you really, when you compare this with bacteria or archaea, you get to really understand many different things about why eukaryotes have a particular capability to grow much larger in size and volume, but also get into some very sophisticated uh, biochemistry that is unique only to eukaryotes. I do want to get you familiarized with a bunch of terms and encourage you to take time to memorize them because they're going to be important for you uh, as we move into a new area of uh, the chapter. But this is going to help you with your compendium of knowledge for microbiology. A saprophyte is an organism that lives. That means it obtains either organic compounds and energy, or both, off of dead and decaying organic matter. Now that differs from a parasite, which forms a symbiotic relationship that benefits the parasite organism and is usually detrimental to the other party, the host. Usually the parasite is obtaining energy or organic compounds uh, from living organisms. Now in the past, biology divided eukaryotes into kingdoms of animal, plants, fungi, protozoans. Now, based on the 18S ribosomal RNA sequence analysis, which we kind of mentioned earlier in the previous chapter, algae, which was formerly considered part of the plant kingdom, fungi and protozoans are not as clearly defined. They kind of have this funky overlap that seems to be some of it was passed from algae to some protozoans. Some capabilities were passed over to fungi. So it gets very confusing. The divisions will be discussed as the book has discussed them. Uh, you can take a look at figure 12.1, uh, and you can kind of see how we start dealing with the issues of meiosis and mitosis. Remember that phylogeny is, evol is a term used to define evolutionary relatedness of organisms. When we deal with cell reproduction, we have mitosis and meiosis. You may have gone over this in A and P, anatomy and physiology. Mitosis is a form of asexual reproduction. It's used in cell division for the production of body cells in humans, but what you really have is cells that are diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes, 
and you basically form daughter cells that have, again, two sets of chromosomes. There's no significant genetic mixing. Meiosis is a bit different because it's a form of sexual reproduction. Basically, it's used in cell division for the production of gametes in humans. Okay, So there you're going to have the process that's going to go from uh, diploid cells to haploid cells. So from two sets of chromosomes to one set of chromosome, the resultant daughter cells are going to be gametes, either ova or sperm. Now that's in humans. We have a little bit of a different definition when we start talking about uh, sexual reproduction, meiotic divisions, etc., when we start dealing with the other different forms of life, particularly fungi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Keep in mind that the haploid cells, each of them only has one set of chromosomes, so they fuse, and you form a new diploid organism, and you tend to have genetic mixing. That new genetic organism is going to be diploid. Sorry. And you can see that here. And this happens in certain organisms where basically you will have a haploid organism that's much more visible. They will produce sex cells by mitosis. These sex cells will fuse, forming a diploid cell, and you form a diploid organism, and that then produces the next generation of haploid cells. What we need to do is take a little bit of a more understanding. And by the way, when we talk about fungi as we're moving into this, you need to be familiarized with a couple of different concepts here for morpho morphological forms. Yeast, these are single cell fungi. Molds, these are filamentous types of fungi. And of course, many people hear about fungi and they think of mushrooms, especially on your pizza. But they're simply the reproductive structures of certain fungi. Um, as the book says, similar to a peach on a peach tree. And many of these fungi really are edible. You have to know which ones are edible and which ones are not. Um, and also you have to keep in mind that the cell walls are a little bit different. They don't contain cellulose, but they contain another molecule, chitin. And this is similar to the chitin that's found in the exoskeletons of uh, insects. So there you have examples there on that image. Um, the first one on the left is Candida albicans, which is a infectious yeast that can be difficult. You have uh, the blue circles are the asexual reproductive cells. In the middle, what you have is a mold that has begun to rot out a potato, and it's, you have lots of intertwined mycelia. And then finally, you have Amantia muscar muscaria, uh, muscaria, which is a highly poisonous mushroom. Amantin poison is very, very nasty, and usually there's no uh, treatment for it. Now, let's talk about fungi. They can either be saprophytic or parasitic. They require organic compounds for energy as, and as carbon sources. Most fungi are aerobic or facultative anaerobic. Many cause diseases in plants. Some cause diseases in animals, including humans. Many cause diseases in immunocompromised patients. So you need to understand that there is some distinction here. If you have an individual that is very healthy, they won't have certain infections. Those that have their immunity that has been suppressed, either due, due to HIV or some other immunosuppressive disease, or receiving radiation treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to fight off cancer, they're immunocompromised and they're going to be more susceptible to some of these diseases that a healthy person would fight off. Mycology is the study of fungi. Fungi are decomposers. They release carbon dioxide and nitrogen compounds back into the soil during the breakdown of organic compounds. They are very important in the recycling of nutrients in the environment. Some are microscopic while others are macroscopic. Okay. Now, if you take a peek, you can see the hyphae and the sporangium there. That's in black bread mold. Okay, so whenever you get sort of that blackish mold forming when you've held bread and it's been there too long, that's what you see there. And the sporangia are housing asexual reproductive cells called sporangiospores. And if you go to table 12.1, 
here we have the distinction of the four uh, major groups. Okay, uh, all fungi have chitin in the cell walls, which I, I talked about. They lack flagellated cells at all times of their life cycle. So this is kind of a distinguishing characteristic from other types of eukaryotic members. There are four groups of true fungi, and this is based on the methods of their sexual reproduction. Zygomycetes, common bread roll, rhizopus is known for being a common food spoilage mold. Now, you have the groups, the basidiomycetes, all right, that's mushrooms and puffballs. And in a basidiocarp, it has gills, which distribute the spores for reproduction. Some mushrooms can be poisonous. Amantia verosa, which is also called the destroying angel, contains the deadly poison amantian. Other amantia machera are also called the fly agaric, produce an hallucinogenic drug Ibotenic acid. Ibotenic acid, by the way, um, in some situations is known to be so powerful that uh, basically an individual can drink the urine of someone who took um, one of those hallucinogenic mushrooms and the ibotenic acid will still be present there. Now, I'm not trying to say that just to be gross, but the, the reality is, is that uh, there's some individuals that abuse uh, some of these uh, situations where we find fungi, etc., and uh, they tend to lose all control of everything, including their bowels, etc. Okay, um, so you need to be aware that there are some uh, mushrooms that are not only some of them would be considered toxic, but other ones that are considered very, very hallucinogenic, etc. Now. Ascomycetes, these include yeasts, which include Saccharomyces cerevisiae, ba uh, baker's yeast. They would include also Penicillium and Aspergillus. Uh, the other group that you have is Chytridomyces, which are a close relative. They have flagellated sexual spores. They've been kind of in that iffy group as Deuteromycetes. What happens is basically you end up with... Um, 10, 20 years, further research in mycology, and some of the names get much more clearer. They come up with another unusual form of fungi, and so then they have to try to first, they'll throw it into Deuteromyces as sort of a catch-all until they can really classify it, okay? Common groups of fungal no forms, note, they have nothing to do with classification, but they are terms for structural descriptive purposes. Yeast, moles, and... Um, let me give you some perspective here. Cell um, yeast are single-celled fungus. They reproduce by binary fission or budding. An example of budding, you might see, oh, you will see the budding in uh, the, the lab that we deal with uh, yeast. And it, it looks like it's asymmetrical it's kind of like a small part breaking off but interestingly enough that's more mitotic in its approach moles are filamentous fungi they're composed of hypha plural is hyphae and the single filament you can see here starting from the spore and spreading outward uh, the white mass is called the mycelium and you form these hyphae now to help you understand this, um, the spore is the reproductive cell that usually sprouts into once you reach a favorable habitat. The germ tube is the projection from the spore, which forms the hyphae. So you look from going left to right, you start spore, spore with a germ tube, spore now having the germ tube form into the hypha, and then you start forming a larger mass, complex hyphae that become the mycelium. Okay. Now, also notice in there, if you can, these look like little rings from the side. Some hyphae will become um, having a, a wall between each of the cells that make up the uh, hyphae. And the walling off will allow for one nuclei. In some cases, though, some of the hyphae become multinucleated because they never form a wall. Okay? Now, 
Most mycelium stay in the growth medium, whether it's bread or liquid or something else like that, whereas others rise above the growth surface, such as a mushroom or puffball. Now, if you sit there and say mushroom or puffball, but where does it get its nutrients? Yes, from the soil, but also the decaying organic matter that is in the soil. The interesting thing is that hyphae have a high surface to volume ratio. This allows it to absorb the nutrients. What happens with a lot of um, molds is they're going to release enzymes to the environment to break down the nutrient source matter. And the hyphae spread out uh, throughout the food source to absorb the nutrients. Now, there are particular terms you need to be aware of. Hostoria is one. This is a specialized hyphae, a parasitic fungi that penetrates cell walls of plants and animals. Rhizoids are specialized hyphae of the saprophytic fungi. Dimorphic fungi, this is an interesting point because this is more medically related here. Dimorphic fungi are fungi that exhibit growth either as a yeast, so a single cell, or as a mycelia. And this depends on the environmental conditions. So, they, some organisms might appear yeast-like if they are within tissues and mycelia-like if they are, for example, in the soil. Okay, Mycorrhizas are fungi in a mutually beneficial association with plant roots. As such, they extend the nutrient and water absorption from the soil uh, for the plants. This has become a big commercial operation. If you look at uh, fungi imperfecta, um, you will find there's a gentleman by the name of Stamets. And Stamets has done this tremendous amount of work on fungal uh, relationships, etc., over several decades and has shown how they can be useful for production of food, for production of uh, medicines and drugs, as well as the recyclement and uh, bioremediation, cleaning up of toxic materials, because the fungi have the enzymes necessary to break down the materials. If you look at lichens, these are a symbiotic organism. In other words, you have two or more organisms living together in a mutual beneficial relationship. They consist of a fungi with a photosynthetic organism. That organism would either be algae or cyanobacteria. Why is this so important? They also help in the breakdown of material. And the breakdown could be wood, could be stone. I've seen whole clusters of lichens on a pile of shale uh, blown off from the side of a mountaintop, and it is the first when these lichens die, they create the first organic matter on the top of that or on the side of that rocky, stony mountain. And that organic matter eventually builds up as soil as time goes on. So you can see this here. There's an algal layer, and then there is a fungal layer. The fungal hyphae provides some of the, uh, you might call it, um, shelter and basically a foundation by which the algal layer, which is producing... Um, the sugars, the fungal layer will produce the carbohydrate, will produce the uh, phosphate and minerals to basically keep the alga layer alive, and the alga layer will give the um, sugars that it synthesizes by photosynthesis to the fungal layer, and it works out very nicely. Okay, habitats and growth. Fungi are found everywhere on the planet. Some can live in fuel lines and consume synthetic plastics. Fungal spores travel via air currents throughout the planet. Fungal spores are not heat tolerant like endospores, but they can tolerate certain amounts of ultraviolet light. Fungal spores are also the major cause of asthma. You will note this that some asthmatics can have very difficult times after a thunderstorm because of the up currents and down currents that occur in thunderstorms. They will spread soil particles and fungal spores. And that's a lot of times when some of these individuals will have an, a, an attack of asthma. Now the range of growth for some fungi include high or low pH, high and low temperature, and even some can withstand high salt or low oxygen levels. But most fungi prefer 70% or greater moisture content. What you're looking there, by the way, is that uh, Michael rises in that image and they are in intimate contact with the roots and they enhance the plant's life. Okay? Now, 
what you see here are leaf cutter ants. They're actually bringing in the leaves and they're going to have these little fungal forms in their uh, nests and that's going to be a food source for the ants. By the way, fungal diseases in humans, if you need to, which I really encourage you, you need to start getting used to this now, fungal diseases in humans occur in four possible ways. One, allergic reaction to fungal spores. This is a hypersensitivity reaction. Two, Adverse reaction of fungal toxins. This could be mushroom toxins, aflatoxins, etc. And this intoxication, in some cases, can be lethal. Aflatoxins are actually fungal mold that you would see in things like corn and peanuts, etc. And by consuming those products, and there's a certain limit to aflatoxins in food crops, that's been set by uh, USDA just for this reason, because aflatoxins can uh, uh, cause liver cancer, okay? So, fungal, the fungi may grow on the body, either internally or externally. These are known as uh, mycoses. Or the fungi may destroy human food stocks. This is where we get into rice, smut, wheat, rust, etc. Um, there was a rye smut that led to the formation. It, it actually caused the formation of like an LSD, and it was called egg rot. And uh, in some cases, it also led to the hallucinations, and some people believe it was related to the Salem witch trials because they were hallucinating when they were really just consuming contaminated food that had uh, some of the, the rye smut, the fungi in there. Now, some fungal toxins, as I mentioned, can cause cancer. The best known is the aflatoxins produced by Asper Aspergillus species. These can be found in peanuts and other grains, and they can cause liver cancer. Egg rot is a fungi known for as uh, rice smut, which forms alkaloids, ergotamine, which can block circulation and induce hallucinations. One of the other things that was interesting was um, individuals that consumed the rice smut contaminated grains, what would happen is the ergotamine can cause massive vasoconstriction to the point where they literally would lose their limbs. That's how powerful it was. And before I go, I wanted to give you a view of a typical mushroom with the gills and the hyphae. Notice that the hyphae are under the ground and causing to the surface the formation of the mushrooms. And this is the budding issue that I was talking about earlier. Very common you see in yeast formations. Um, notice that the nucleus will attempt to go through a mitosis-like formation, but this is a completely unequal cytokinesis where the budding will actually interact with microtubules that will pull away some of the chromosomes and eventually have the formation of a new uh, nucleus for that bud, which turns into a new cell, but the, as the bud breaks off, you still have the much larger mass of the cell with its own nucleus. Okay, mycosis. And by the way, this is the binary fission that you see. What can happen also is you can have fragmentation of the hyphae. Now I bring this up because there are some diseases that occur when you have the fragmentations of the hyphae. Um, I believe it is San Joaquin Valley fever that the hyphae break up as they're in the soil. The soil dries, they start breaking up these little pieces and people inhale them and they start having a mycosis. Okay. Speaking of mycosis, the fungal diseases that you should be aware of include histoplasmosis caused by the fungus Histoplasma capsulum, Cocidio mycosis, which is caused by the fungus Cocidiosis immidis, which has been known also to be experimented on for a bioweapon. Candidiitis, which is caused by the fungus Candidia albicans. These infections can be uh, classified by the site of the infection. So superficial mycosis in hair, skin, nails. Intermediate mycosis in respiratory skin and subcutaneous tissues. Systemic mycosis deep within the tissues inside the body, such as in lungs or in the abdominal cavity. Microsporia, microsporidium, um, causes a diarrhea. It is an intercellular fungi and it's be considered, used to be considered a protozoan. 
and only really affects immunocompromised patients. That is those patients with HIV, AIDS. Okay, now if you look at a bunch of these ones, you're going to be coming up to them. Note the pages. We will be going into much more detail with these discussions as we move through the uh, chapters later on. So you don't have to memorize absolutely everything now, but get a little bit familiarized with the names, etc. Okay, now we're going to move into algae. Now, algae. Algaology is the study of algae. These organisms use light energy to convert carbon dioxide and water to carbohydrates and oxygen. This is basically photosynthesis, which is why we had to learn a little bit about photosynthesis in the previous chapter. A lot of them contain chlorophyll A, and they also contain unique pigments that help capture the other wavelengths of light. Okay, so if you take a peek at Table 12.3, you'll see the different types of uh, principal pigments. Some of these you're probably familiar with, hearing carotenes, uh, xenophils, chlorophyll B, as well as chlorophyll A for green algae. And then, of course, you get some of the more unique ones, the phycobilins, etc. Now, this includes both unicellular and multicellular organisms. So when we talk about algae, we're talking about, uh, in some cases, that green fuzzy stuff you might see. Um, on surface of water or the long algae such as the brown algae and all the other fun ones that you see washing up on the beaches. But they lack an organized vascular system. An organized vascular system you would see in plants. They possess a simple reproductive system. They do not directly infect humans, but they do produce toxins in self shellfish and other fish that can be ingested by humans, resulting in illnesses. This is where we get into some of the cases of paralytic shellfish poisoning. One of the primary producers of carbohydrates, they're also a major producer of a large proportion of the oxygen in the atmosphere. The names of algae groups are derived from the cell wall structure, photosynthetic pigments, type of storage products, mode of reproduction and the mechanism of their motility. Phytoplankton are a unicellular algae that makes up a large amount of this type of organism class that in turn makes up a large major food source for many of the marine animals, large and small. You've heard of uh, some of the baleen whales, the whales that basically take in phytoplankton. This is what they consume. Usually one of the first organisms on a barren or uh, environment or a new environment, such as a rock top, mountain top, some volcano that suddenly just popped up out of the middle of the ocean, it's going to be algae. Okay? And here you see an image of a vol volvox. Now algae can be both, as I said, microscopic, macroscopic. Microscopic, they're usually single-celled organisms. They may be free-floating or motile via flagella, and they can grow into long chains or filaments. Here we see a volvox. Now this is a round colony organism. It's composed of 500 to 60,000 biflagellated cells. So each one of those cells, you see those little dots? Those are really just flagella. Okay? In each one of those dotted areas, there's, that's just composed of a cell. Now, inside of that larger volvox are smaller ones that are ready to burst out. Okay. Now, when you look at the macroscopic, the large scale, multicellular organisms compose of specialized structures. Best example, seaweed. Seaweed, if you notice there on the diagram, you're going to have structures such as a holdfast. Now, this is not a root. Everybody thinks it's a root. It's not. It's really not for nutrient transfer like the root, but what it really does is act as an anchoring mechanism. So it anchors to somewhat uh, a rock or an area. It doesn't bring up any nutrients up the stipe. Now the stipe is the stalk structure, which has blades attached to it. The blades are the large flat structures used for photosynthesis. They may have also some reproductive structures on it. Now there may be bladders attached to them. These are these kind of gas-filled floats that are used to help maintain the blades in direct sunlight. So they keep them kind of floating. Otherwise, they might just sink to the bottom. Or remember that light only travels so far deeper into the water before it stops. So you have to have what's better considered shallow shorelines 
as opposed to something where you know it's the end of the beach and you just drop off two miles down. That doesn't work very well. You're going to have lots of algae, uh, much seaweed in places where you have these areas of less than let's say 300 feet of depth and of course every time we have storms you have some of the water churned up and everything and some of the seaweed comes and gets moved into uh, on the shoreline. Now the cell walls they have rigid structures composed of pectin and cellulose. Some species also have carrageenan and ag agar. Guess what? Carrageenan you've seen it's used for ice cream. Yes it's a thickening agent. Agar well that's the stuff like we use agarose and we make that for uh, cell culture on our petri dishes. Yep. You will also see diatoms, which contain silicon dioxide. Their skeletal remains form what we call diatomaceous earth. Okay, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. I had an interruption here, so I'm going to try to clip that out. And let's go back to the macroscopic. Uh, when we talk about multicellular organisms, they're composed of specialized structures. The best known is seaweed. So let's talk about that. When you look at seaweed, and if you take a look at the image you have in front of you, you have a holdfast there. That's an attachment structure. Now it's not a root. Everybody might get that mistaken. There are no transfer of nutrients. It's more like an anchor. Now, it's attached to the stipe, and the stipe is basically from which the blades of the sea of the, the seaweed attach to it. Okay? Now the blades are the area which you're going to have these large flat structures and they're used for photosynthesis. Some of them may have reproductive structures on it. Now what keeps these long blades kind of pointed upward toward the surface of the water where the sunlight is? That's where you have gas-filled floats. They're called bladders. And they maintain the blades in sort of the direction of the sunlight. Now, when we talk about uh, these algae forms, you're going to have rigid structures in the cell walls. They're going to be composed though of pectin and cellulose in a similar way to what you see with plants. Some species may also have carrageenan, which if you don't know, is a thickening agent that's used for a lot of different ice creams. It'll also have agar. Hey, wait a minute. Agar, is that the same type of stuff that they use for um, growth on petri dishes for cultures? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, I one time went and interviewed up at a company up in Maine, and they basically harvest the seaweed, purify it, and send it out for agar, agarose, etc., for uh, lots of the biotech industries, etc. Diatoms. Diatoms are smaller algae that basically contain usually silicon dioxide or calcium carbonate. Now the calcium carbonate, what happens is you've probably heard of the white cliffs of Dover. Well those are all made from basically millions and millions of years of diatoms laying down their calcium carbonate and they form these very soft chalky deposits that make the white cliffs of Dover in England but also let's go back to one other thing, the silicon dioxide. The skeletal remains of diatoms form this material called diatomaceous earth. It's used in gardening, it's used in pest control. You may also know of it if you own or know someone that owns a above ground swimming pool where they have their pump and they run the water filtered through diatomaceous earth. Now other cell structures that are found in algae include the nucleus, mitochondria, Mitochondria, of course, doing oxidative phosphorylation and the electron transport chain. So you've got uh, aerobic respiration here, as well as the chloroplasts. Now, there are, when we look at this, two forms of the life form. And this is basically two formats. They, they go through either asexual binary fission so it's mitosis like process or fragmentation where the filaments contain cells and they break into pieces. Each piece forms a new organism or they undergo uh, a sexual process meiosis. So basically you're going to have the algae make haploid structures which form and yield gametes, flagellated cells which swim, fuse together and form an organism. Many algae uh, alternate between haploid and diploid cells. Now the next part is really the part for a healthcare provider. Paralytic shellfish poisoning and other algal toxin poisonings. 
Many algae from the group Pyrophyta produce toxins. Okay? Gymnodidium brevae, red tide, produces brevitoxin, which accumulates in fish that feed on the red tide uh, phytoplankton. Humans that consume the fish suffer tingling sensations, reversal of hot, cold sensations, reduced pulse, diarrhea. The patients recover in about two to three days. It's very rarely um, fatal. Gunulux, which you see the image there, is another species that will cause the red tide. They produce the neurotoxins sexotoxin and gunyatoxin. Both accumulate in shellfish. This is a concept of bio bioaccumulation because shellfish are uh, what they call filter feeders. They just take in water, filter out the algae, and use that for food. But the problem is they build up into the tissues loads of these toxins. So anyone that consumes clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, that has this buildup, well, the humans will exhibit numbness, dizziness, general muscle weakness, impaired respiration, death via usually respiratory failure. That's why if they say there's a red uh, tide uh, warning, uh, the clamshell people, the oyster hunters, and all that else, they're told you can't harvest from those beds. They're contaminated. Gamberdiscus toxicus is another dinoflagellite. Produces a toxin, cigarata toxin that builds up in fish tissues such as grouper, snapper, etc. One of the most toxic compounds and remains toxic even after the fish tissue is cooked. The fish are not visibly affected and can't, can't basically be detected that they are sick. But in humans, it causes gastrointestinal disturbances, diarrhea, central nervous system involvement, and respiratory failure. Pisteria pisida. This is a very nasty one. It's amoeba-like in structure, but it is algae. It can convert to a non-motile cyst or a flagellated zoospore. Normally attacks fish with two toxins, one to paralyze it, the second to actually cause sloughing off the of skin of the fish. To basically, it's feeding on the fish red blood cells. So what happens is, uh, in areas where fisteria has been found, the fish have these large, open, gappy, yucky looking sores there and it's very very difficult but here's the problem you don't want to go into a fisteria contaminated area because they can make toxins one of them is called nogatoxin it's fat soluble and this is the one that causes the lesions on the fish but there's one also that's a water soluble toxin that appears to poison the nervous system people who have done research on fisteria tend to also suffer from uh, the poisoning and it ends up with memory loss. Now other diatoms can produce domonic acid. This is a neurotoxic compound which causes shell, uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning and can lead to vomiting, diarrhea, loss of memory, seizures, and eventually death. Domonic acid can build up in the tissues of shellfish and anemic, uh, excuse me, amnesic shellfish poisoning is a, sim is a uh, syndrome that's due to the loss of short-term memory of the victims. Okay? Now that we've gone through all of that, and it sounds like, wow, I didn't know that these guys were, algae could be damaging. Well, okay. Now you do. Now, before we get moving into the next area, which would be protozoans, I want to give you some familiarization of parasite terms and concepts, because you're going to be dealing with this in microbiology, particularly in medical microbiology. Okay? Or, or healthcare microbiology. Let's talk about parasites for a few minutes because uh, as we start getting into several of the next couple of uh, topics, we're going to be dealing with this a lot. Parasitology is the study of parasites, organisms that live in or on other living organisms. Parasites derive their nutrients from their host. Now, this is a situation where it's a win-lose situation. At the same time, they deprive the host of some of the same nutrients, so therefore, usually with a parasite. The parasite will uh, be enhanced, but at the same time the host is hurt. An ectoparasite is an organism that lives on the outside of the organism. Think of uh, a tick, a leech, a mosquito. An endoparasite is an organism that lives inside of the organism. Think of tapeworm or a malaria parasite. The life cycle of parasites may include one or more hosts and the host may range 
the range of the life cycle may be simple, just one host, or complex, two or three hosts. If more than one host is involved, then the definitive host is defined as the host that harbors the adult or sexual stage of the parasite or the sexual phase of its life cycle. The intermediate host is defined as the host that harbors the larva or a sexual stage of the parasite or the asexual stage of the life cycle. Now, what about a dead-end host, otherwise known as an accidental host? This is a host from which the parasite is not passed on to another host um, and therefore the parasite cannot complete its life cycle. So in other words, it's sort of dead end. It kind of comes into the particular uh, organism, but doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't pass on, it doesn't develop, and it may be eventually die out. An example is there are some flukes that infect fish and birds. They get into humans, the dead end host, and what they do is they cause the swimmer's itch. You see this a lot on, in uh, reports uh, from Long Island and other places like that. Normally they would pass through the life cycle between fish and birds. What happens is they may be swimming and someone's swimming through the waters and they get them and they penetrate into the skin, but then they sort of die out. But they, they cause such an intensive itching and inflammation reaction. Now, a facultative parasite is an organism that can be parasitic but does not have to live as a parasite. It is capable of living as an independent life, apart from the host. Examples of that are the free-living amoeba from the genus Acanthroamoeba that can cause keratoconjunctitis and primary amoebic men meningenoencephalitis. Now, an obligate parasite, remember, obligate is got to do it is an organism that must inhabit the host organism. It lacks the capability to survive on its own. For example, it might be missing a digestive system, etc. So most parasites that infect humans are obligate parasites. What we're going to start doing is dealing with protozoans. First off, protozoology is the study of protozoans. Uh, a trophozoite is a motile, meaning moving, feeding, dividing, stage of the protozoan's life cycle. A cyst is a dormant stage of the protozoan, similar to spore stage of bacteria, but the cyst is not as resistant uh, to heat or other factors as the spore stage that you would see in, let's say, bacteria. Protozoans are single-celled, microscopic, non-photosynthetic, meaning that they must obtain food from other organisms, motile organisms. Many are free-living, whereas others act in a parasitic manner. Now, if you look on uh, figure 1212, this is what we've got in front of us is basically the classification. Traditionally, they've been classified by mode of locomotion. More recently, analysis uses ribosomal RNA comparisons, and the data indicates greater diversity of species. I used to have an older listing of this, and it was all over the place. And now it's been beefed up and, and a little bit more uh, clarity has been added to it. The focus on this chapter though is going to strictly be on human disease causing organisms. So there are a lot of other protozoans and you could study them and take courses in protozoology but let me tell you that I'm going to just try to keep this only for those organisms that can cause disease. First is a AP complexians. Their structure uh, have a structure called an apical complex on one end to help the organism penetrate the cell membrane of the host cell. These include plasmodium for malaria, which of course is fatal unless treated, and it's a blood parasite. Toxoplasm gondii, which causes toxoplasmosis. Cats are the primary host, humans are the secondary host. Cryptosporidium, cryptosporidiosis, causes a diarrhea disease, and then cyclosporia, which produces cyclosporidiosis. This is particularly from Cyclosporia catenaceus, which is a traveler's diarrhea, and it can be from fecally contaminated produce. Uh, in the mid-1990s, there was an incident where somehow a large wedding uh, reception of 200 guests, a lot of people got sick. CDC got called in, and to make a long story short, they were able to track back. They first thought it was the strawberries. It turned out to be the raspberries that were in this big fruit bowl. The raspberries came from Guatemala. Somebody was a world traveler. 
because at the time the cyclosporia that was tracked was found to be from India. Now wait a minute Dr. Roberts, you said that how could it get from there to there to there? When they tried to find the fields where they got the raspberries, they found that this was a place where a lot of transients, individuals that would come in, do some work, and then they would move on. They believed that somebody was a world traveler, and basically what they did was they got to Guatemala, money ran out, and they started working, picking raspberries in Guatemala. And of course, they don't have porta potties, so the people did their business in the fields and continued to keep picking things. Okay? And that's how they contaminated the raspberries. I know some of you are probably going, yeah, but yeah, that's sometimes how things happen. Now, the next diplomonads and parabalcylids. Parabalcylids, these are flagellated protozoan. They may have one or many flagella during their life cycle. They use it for sensory or for locomotion. These types of protozoa lack mitochondria. Both groups reproduce asexually. Some parabacillids will reproduce sexually as well. Now, the diplomonads have two nuclei, live within hosts where conditions are anaerobic or in stagnant water where oxygen levels are low. Good example, Giardia limbilia, which causes giardiosis. Uh, giardiasis is, is an organism that will get into the intestine. It can lead to all sorts of problems, diarrhea, etc. As a matter of fact, it can be in there for a year. It is, if you're a camper, it's well known as beaver fever because beavers, wherever they poop in the water, downstream, uh, campers will sometimes drink the water and get it. Parabacillids live in within a host organism. They hide, have a hydrogen, hydrogen some, which makes some ATP along with hydrogen. And so they produce this kind of gassy, frothy situation. The best known is Trichomonas vaginalis, which causes trichomoniasis. Uh, that accounts for the vaginal infection. We'll talk more about that when we get into general urinary infections later on the course. Kinetoplastids have at least one flagella and a complex um, basically uh, pass uh, a complex ring uh, structure of DNA in a large uh, mitochondria consisting of a series of thousands of interlocking rings. Now, the two that you have here are very important. Trypanosoma, which is the African sleeping sickness, and it's transmitted by tsetse fly. There is another type of trypanosoma that causes Chagas disease, and it's transmitted by the kissing bug, Triatome. Um, you're going to need to get this down later on, and I really encourage you because one of the th big challenges in our society today is individuals that are migrants that come into another area of the world. Particularly they found that some of the individuals coming in from Central and South America into the United States are, are ill with Chagas disease and may end up transmitting it. Dogs have been found to be also a reservoir of this particular parasite. Now Leishmania, Leishmaniasis has been transmitted by sand flies. We have a lot of troops that have been in former areas such as Afghanistan and um, Iraq, and they've come home with what's kind of called sandfly, uh, the sandfly uh, lesion, and it's really leishmania, and it'll show up as a huge sore on their side of their face if they were bitten by the sandfly. I'll have more of that when we get into some of these protozoal uh, organisms in the lab. Lobesians and heterolobesians, they have an amoeboid, flexible body form. Lobesians move by means of a pseudopodia. They change shape as they move. So the best idea there is just thinking that, oh yeah, so it's basically like an amoeboid, an amoeba. Yes. Now there's one particular species called entamoeba, and it causes amoebiasis, which causes diarrhea. What it also does is in the lower bowel, it will cause, in some cases with a bad infestation, ulceration there. Okay. Heterolobesians exist in amoeboid form only part of their life cycle. They will also form flagellated cells. Neglaria phalari, which swim in warm, warm waters. They can get into humans via the nasal cavity, travel up into the brain, destroy the brain of the host. Survival is zero. Usually death is within 10 days. Now, if you think about during the summer, when you listen to the news, every once in a while they'll say somebody died from their brain by a parasite. 
And that's because they dove in nose first. There's actually some places in the south where they will say, do not, you know, drink the water, do, you know, have nose plugs, have eye protection for these waters because they are warm, A, and B, they've got that particular naglaria present. Now, what about the habitats of uh, protozoans? Well, interestingly enough, these organisms can be found in marine, freshwater, terrestrial environments. They are essential decomposers. They can be parasites for algae, plants, animals, and even humans. Their structure, they lack rigid cell walls, but have definite structure due to structures underlying the plasma membrane. Form ammifera, or hard shells composed of calcium and silicon compounds. This is sort of the uh, cytoskeleton that you might see for some of these protozoans. Protozoans will contain a uh, nucleus. Some have mitochondria and other membrane-bound organelles. They will not have chloroplasts, so they don't have the capability for photosynthesis. Many possess specialized structures for locomotion, such as cilia, flagella, pseudopodia. Feeding can occur uh, by diffusion of small molecules, but usually they include ingestion of large molecules or particles via phagocytosis or pinocytosis. Some organisms use cilia to direct food into a food pocket, a mouth-like structure. For reproduction, some protozoan life cycles are very complex and may involve one or more hosts. Some protozoans have different forms during, uh, you, excuse me, different forms during different stages of their life. So they're called polymorphic. Now many protozoans are disseminated from their host during the cis stage. At the protozoid stage, the organisms would die if left out of the host. That's why once the cyst is ingested by another host, it reverts to the vegetative stage. So remember, trophozoite is active. Cyst is inactive. If someone passes out of their body, say through waste uh, fecal matter, usually the success of the parasite in a protozoan will be by the cyst surviving until it's picked up by another host. Protozoans use sexual means to exchange parts of their nuclei in a that manner very similar to conjugation, but many also perform asexual reproduction as some, by some means similar uh, to binary fission. Various means of binary fission depend on the direction of the fission, and the loci, uh, the location of the host cell. Now, I include this in the notes. Um, it's very, very important that you understand these things. Um, you will, when we go into the protozoan lab, we'll go through some of the examples of the uh, sexual and asexual reproduction. One of them is called schizogony, which is a, a process of multiple fissions of the nucleus of the protozoans prior to the production of multiple daughter cells. So what happens literally is inside of the cell, you have multiple formations of nuclei then the cell begins to break up into smaller cells. This leads to a cyclic clinical symptoms of the malaria. You've probably heard of that one. Happens is that when the red blood cell lyses or breaks open, you're going to have this release of new parasite cells, but also toxic metabolic byproducts. And they're going to be released into the bloodstream, and this is going to cause the individual to go through a, a period of chills, headache, myalgias, and malaise. Okay? Now, also there's an important uh, point that I want to bring to your attention, and that is if you go to table 12.4. Oh, and here is the different types. I'm sorry, I did have that. Uh, you have longitudinal binary fission, regular binary fission, you can see this, multiple fission, the schizogony, and then the transverse binary fission there. Take a look at 12.4. You don't need to memorize it all now, but you're going to be introduced to a lot of these diseases as we walk through the disease sections of the various physiological systems, for example, respiration, uh, respiratory, blood, digestive, etc. Okay? I would encourage you to review also the case presentation in 12.1, as well as the microassessment. Now, the other area we're going to start dealing with is slime molds. And this used to be considered a type of fungi, but it's really a product of convergent evolution. Two organisms develop similar traits due to adaptations to similar environments, but they're not really related on a molecular, that is, a genetic level. They are important for the breakdown of dead and decaying matter in the environment. 
There are three groups, acellular slime molds, cellular slime molds, and water molds. The plasmodian slime molds, formerly were called acellular slime molds, uh, both the slime molds are found on terrestrial soil in forest matter, such as leaves, wood, decaying. Plasmodium slime molds are more widespread. Following sporulation and germination, the motile amoeboid cells form a uh, amoeba which forms a multinucleated plasmodium. The plasmodium oozes slime to digest anything it covers and absorbs the nutrients. The plasmodium will later form a spore bearing fruiting body to reproduce. Okay? Now, cellular slime molds, similar to acellular, but the amoeba like cells form a cell mass called a slug which then forms a fruiting body and spores. Water moles, oomycetes, they do not have chlorophyll like other heterocons, like algae. They form masses of white threads on decaying matter. They have flagellated reproductive cells. They can cause serious plant diseases like potato blight, which led in part to the Irish potato famine of 1845-46. Now, from here, and you can see how this is related on an evolutionary uh, chart, and you see here the white threads secreting digestive enzymes to break down organic compounds, and this, if I'm not mistaken, is a fish. Okay. Now we're going to start dealing with a different type of organism. It is eukaryotic. Helmets. Helmets consist of three groups of interests. Nematodes, cestodes, trematodes. Nematodes are roundworms. Flatworms are divided into cestodes and trematodes. Cestodes would be tapeworms, trematodes would be flukes. What you see there is a person with elephantitis. And this is uh, due to a buildup of fluid because the adult worms are living in the lymphatic vessels. And they're basically leading from the limb. So what happens is, if you remember, the lymphatic system takes the excess fluid in tissues and puts it back up into the blood. But what you have is certain organisms that will live into that in that lymphatic system. Therefore, they plug it up and you have the buildup, this back buildup of fluid in the tissues. Very nasty, very painful. Now, helmets can infect animals, including humans and plants. All helmets that infect humans are endoparasites. They live inside. Many, there are many ways to identify uh, parasitic infection. And basically, it's usually to examine and identify parasitic eggs and cysts. The life cycle includes three stages, egg, larvae, adult. Some helmets have more than one host. So you have a definitive and an intermediate host, which we've talked about before. Some have more than one intermediate host or definitive host. For example, the fish tapeworm. Diphlythrothrillium latum is a three-host parasite. It has two intermediate hosts. First, a, uh, the cyclops, which is a crustacean, and then freshwater fish. And the definitive host is a human. Also, we have the dog tapeworm. Diphyllidium canum can have uh, for its definite host dogs, cats, or yes, humans. The portal of entry. How do these guys get in? The method by which the parasite or organism enters this can be for uh, helmets either oral or integumentary. Remember, so basically either consuming or by attachment by the skin and boring into the skin. Host tissue targets. Well, parasites infest various or, or selective tissues of the host. Some infest in the eyes, onchocerociasis. Others are located in the small veins of the pelvic region, that's schistosomes while others form cyst-like structures causing hydratidosis. These will form, uh, it looks like a cyst, but they can do it in the brain tissues uh, for the cestodes, enterococcus granulosus or uh, echinococcus multiocularis. Some of them will form uh, the uh, hydratids in, uh, near the heart or liver, etc. The parasites can also remain in the lumen within organs. Tapeworms occupy the lumen of the digestive system, usually in the small intestine. Some require special structures to remain in place. Um, for example, the protozoa Giardia lambia uses sucker attachments to remain in the intestinal microvilli. Now, you compare that to hookworms. 
Now we've talked about protozoans already, but let's talk about hookworms. They use a jaw-like structure to attach to the walls of the small intestine. Because of that, they're able to basically bite into, break some capillaries, and suck the blood from the small intestine. Tapeworms have small hooklets, and they attach to the walls of the small intestine. Now, let's go uh, from host tissue, uh, tissue targets to the actual nematodes themselves. Now, I've kept up this table to give you some of the perspective of what you're looking at, and we'll go over some of the other aspects in a minute. Nematodes, roundworms. If you take a look here, this is an example of Ascaris. Ascaris lumbricoides, uh, which causes Ascaritis. Now, they have a cylindrical tapered body with a tubular digestive tract that extends from mouth to anus. They have two separate sexes. They're called dioecious, possessing two separate sexes in some cases. Uh, they include a large number of species. Some are free living. Uh, such as in soils and water. Generally, they infect humans in either the gastrointestinal tract, such as the hookworm, whipworm, ascaria, and pinworms, or infect blood and other tissues. For example, filaria, which causes the elephantitis that we talked about, infect the limb system. Trichinella, remember, cook your uh, pork, because a lot of pork is infected with trichinella, and that's why you have to, to cook it very, very well. Otherwise, it will go from the stomach, from the food, into eventually your muscles, and that's where it will insist. Loa loa, the African eye worm, will actually travel uh, through the eye tissue. Uh, onchocerakiasis, caused by Onchocerica volvolis, is a microfilaria which can invade the eye or the skin. It causes intense inflammatory reactions, and I refer you back to perspective 12.1 for that. Now, let's talk about the cestodes, tapeworms. Uh, they have a flat, ribbon-shaped bodies that are segmented. The head, the scolex of the tapeworm, has suckers for attachment to the intestinal wall and sometimes has hooks or hooklets, and you can see those in the diagram. Behind the head are segments. Now, each one of those segments are referred to as proglottids that have, interestingly enough, both male and female organs. They're hermaphroditic. They basically can produce sperm and the eggs, and they will self-fertilize, and they provide, uh, the proglottids will become gravid, in which contain lots of fertilized eggs. The eggs will pass out in the feces. If the proglottid section, this is where we get into the tape idea, uh, sometimes they will break off containing the eggs, and that will pass out in the feces too. Interestingly enough, they don't have a digestive system, but they don't need to. They're swimming around in the small intestine, absorbing nutrients directly from the surrounding environment in the lumen of the intestine of the host. They're often associated with beef, fish, lamb, pork. Transmission occurs via consumption of undercooked meat. Infection can also occur from accidental ingestion of cat or dog fleas, because cat or dog fleas are the intermediate hosts of the dog tapeworms. Now, we get up into trematodes, which are known as flukes. And these are bilaterally symmetrical. They're flat and leaf-shaped. They have separate sexes. They're, di they're uh, dioecious. Uh, in the schistosomes, the blood flukes, the female is smaller and fits into the male's groove, which is a gynocorphoric groove or canal. All other flukes are hermaphroditic. Now you see there are larvae of a schistosome in the image there. And I've got some other images too, so if you see images in the next... Uh, so many slides. Please don't be just, you know, trying to get frittered and upset and trying to look everywhere for the uh, images in the book. I've added stuff to really enhance the understanding here. Now, some species are not parasitic at all. Planaria, Dugesia, is a fresh water flatworm. But many have a complicated life cycle and may include one or more intermediate hosts. Usually the larvae escape from the egg swim freely, this is called a morassidia, until they come into their first host, for example, a snail. The larvae further develop inside the snail, later become free-swimming saccharia, which has a tail structure, which is what you see there. The saccharia will swim and penetrate into the definitive host human. A lot of times what it will happen with schistosoma is uh, they will come up and someone's walking in the water and they'll bore into the skin. And uh, this causes uh, schistosomiasis. Fasciola hepatica is a liver fluke. 
This is common if you're in the Nile. Don't swim in the Nile because the liver flukes are going to be there. Okay, I encourage you to review the microassessment there for um, basically the schistosomes. Now we're going to move into, oh yes, that's the um, schistosome, the gynophoric canal. So basically you have the male and the female there. Okay. And here you have a CDC diagram to help you to understand further. Pork is ingested by the human. The individual um, has sericocosis and it has a tapeworm. You can see the hooklets, you can see the scolex, the adult worm. By the way, they can get as long as 60 centimeters. So we're talking over several feet easy. The oven overfilled proglottids are passed out in the human feces. A lot of times what happened is people used to use human fecal matter as fertilizer. Not a good move. They wouldn't compost it correctly. The heat would not be enough to kill off these parasites. And in some developing countries, that's where the pigs would uh, ingest them. Okay. And here is an image, micro image of a tapeworm. You can see the larger proglottids here. And you can see the skull legs up here. Here you can see an image really close and you see this vast network here. This is not a digestive system because remember they don't have one. What you have here on this side is the release of the eggs and then you have several other structures here and basically you have both uh, testes in essence and ovary that produce lots of eggs and you have got a self-fertilizing organism. Okay, moving from here we're going to go to arthropods, vectors. Again, we're talking about eukaryotic organisms. I encourage you to take time to know Table 12.6. It's going to help you in a lot of ways to understand as we deal with eukaryotic uh, pathogenic organisms in the up and coming chapters. Arthropods consist of both arachnids and insects. The distinction is basically between an insect and an arachnid. The arachnid has no wings, has two body parts, basically a head and an abdomen and eight legs. The insect may or may not have wings, has three body parts, the head, thorax, abdomen, and has six legs. Let's talk about them being vectors. These are organisms that are carriers of disease. There's two types, the mechanical vectors, the biological vectors. Mechanical vectors pick up parasitic cysts or pathogens from point A and deliver it to point B. For example, a housefly picks up parasitic eggs from animal feces in a meadow on its sticky hairs on its legs, flies through an open window and delivers them to the food that the fly lands on or walks on. Oh, and by the way, there is a reading somewhere in the chapters uh, uh, that basically did a study and showed how something like 300 plus pathogenic bacteria can be easily transmitted by a fly landing on your food. And that includes Helicobacter pylori. So make you wonder about whether you want to allow the flies anywhere near your food. And then we have the biological vector. This is an arthropod in whose body the pathogen multiplies and matures, or both. Many arthropods are vectors of human diseases. Arthropod involvement in human diseases can consist of four ways. The arthropod may actually be the cause of the disease. For example, scabies due to mites tunneling subcutaneously and causing itching. An arthropod may serve as the intermediate host in the life cycle of a parasite, the flea in the life cycle of the dog tapeworm, the tsetse fly in the life cycle of African trypanosomiasis, African sleeping sickness, simulin, a black fly in the life cycle of onchocerociasis, or the mosquito in the life cycle of filiariasis. The arthropod may serve as the definitive host in the life cycle of the parasite, the mosquito in the life cycle of malaria, for example. Or the arthropod may serve as a vector in the transmission of an infectious disease. Examples, oriental rat flea in the transmission of plague, tick in the transmission of Rocky Mountain spotted fever or Lyme disease, louse in the transmission of epidemic typhus, or we can take something like the mosquito in the transmission of a Zika virus or dengue fever, and we can go on and on and on, but you'll get the point. Let's deal with first organism, an insect. Everybody knows the mosquito. The female mosquito feeds on the blood of warm-blooded animals. Now, it's only the female that does this, and the reason it does this is it has to provide a high-protein meal 
for the development of her eggs. But the problem is that when they pierce through the skin, it will release some of the saliva. Now the saliva has anti-clotting agents, but it will also cause itching afterwards. That itch is due to your reaction to the clotting factors in the saliva. But as it releases the saliva, it may uh, bite more than one host to help spread some diseases. Also in the saliva may be a variety of pathogenic agents. Um, therefore, the mosquito is the definitive host, not hoist, but host, sorry about the typo, uh, for malaria parasites, the plasmodian sexual reproductive uh, part of the cycle. It's also the vector for equine encephalitis, yellow fever, West Nile disease, uh, chikungunya, um, dengue fever, yellow fever, and Zika, okay? And you can see these happy little nasty bugs here. This is the internal anatomy of the mosquito. What happens in some cases is that when the mosquito consumes the blood of an infected person, uh, the organisms will develop inside the stomach, then migrate up into the salivary glands where they'll be passed onward, okay? And we're going to move from here to the flea. A flea is a wingless insect. Xenocylius chiopthus or Purelex irritans, the human flea, they feed on blood of warm-blooded animals. They can transmit Yersinia pestis, that's the bacteria for plague, Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. Yep, everybody thinks it's just the ticks, but that can happen. Uh, larval fleas also have chewing mouth, a uh, chewing type of mouth to ingest organic matter. And so they will consume animal feces. They ingest dog and, and cat tapeworm eggs from the feces. The flea can also live for months without a meal. And they can hop great distances. Next, lice. Now what you see there is Pediculus humanus, which is a body louse. And here is another picture of them. Now, the lice are an insect. They're small, wingless, that feed on the blood of warm-blooded animals. They have claws and legs adapted to hold on to the body surfaces and clothing. Pediculus humanus spreads freely from one person to another. There are two subspecies, interestingly enough, the head louse and the body louse. The body louse transmits Bartonella quintana, trench fever, uh, Rickettsia uh, prowatsky, which causes typhus, Borrelia recurrences, which is relapsing fever. And then, if you notice here, I don't know if I had that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, basically, what you have here is the crab louse. Yeah, Phytrius pubis, which transmitted during sexual intercourse. Now, let me see if I can go back here for a second. I want to see. Yeah, that's a tick. Okay, I got the tick out of order, so please bear with me. This is a tick. It is an arachnid. Immature ticks have six legs. Mature adults have eight legs. They are ectoparasites. Dermacenter species are just one type. Uh, from the saliva, during the feeding, they can result in profound paralysis. This occurs in some species. Ticks are also known to transmit Borrelia burgdorferi, Lyme disease, Rickettsia, Rickettsi, and that's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, we find that there are other Ehrlichia type organisms transmitted by ticks, okay? Um, and so basically this is a great major problem. Everybody fears ticks, and rightfully so. Now, before I move from there, I want to go, pardon me, to mites. This is an arachnid, tiny fast-moving ectoparasites. But Skartopsky's scabii creates an itchy rash. They live in the epidermis. This is what causes scabies. Okay. Now, if you look in the diagram there, you see the hair shaft, the skin surface, the epidermis, etc. And what these organisms can do is you can acquire them through sexual intercourse. That's where you get some of the crabs also. You can have dust mites. Uh, that can cause allergies and asthma. But what they usually do is they bore into the epidermis, they lay their eggs, and that leads to further problems. Now, mites of rodents can transfer to humans, causing Rickettsia acari, which is also known as Rickettsia pox. Okay? 
Ah, before I finish, more insects. A couple of other ones I want you to be aware of. And also I have a lot more photos and images uh, in videos, etc., that will be in the vectors uh, lab. So we'll get more of that. The reduvid bugs, otherwise known as triatoma sangua, sangua also called the blood-sucking cone nose or kissing bug, triatoma species and rhodonius species. They transmit Chagas disease, American trypanosomiasis, which is caused by an infection with trypanosoma cruzi. The bugs live in the burrows or nests of wild animals and in dark, sheltered areas of human homes. They particularly like to inhabit mud or adobe houses of Latin America. The reduvid bugs are most active at night. Now, this is what happens. The ectoparasite feeds at night on the blood of sleeping persons. What it'll do is it'll create a wound while it's feeding. What happens is you have a really almost like a hydrodynamic condition where as it's pulling in blood, it has only so much space in its body. So in the back end, it will start forming a droplet. The droplet contains the parasites. And so it's defecating into the wound or near the wound. The parasite is going to be in that big load of liquid feces. And how a person gets the infection, interestingly enough, is the person starts scratching. They scratch the organism into the skin. Okay, and we'll get more into American trypanosomiasis later. The other type of insect that you need to be aware of is the common bed bug, Simmets lotecularis. It does not pass on a disease per se. It is a blood-sucking organism. It can be painful uh, if you get lots of bites. A lot of times it's been found in, in uh, beds. Interestingly enough, it has become very, very prominent. Remember when we were growing up as kids, you might have been told, good night and don't let the bed bugs bite. Well, the bed bugs are coming back to bite us very hard. And uh, I've actually got a, a couple of videos about them. Uh, I want you to see, you'll probably see it in the vector section, but you may see it in several other, if not in the videos in the lecture section. What you have to understand is this. What's been much more uh, uh, concerning for myself is that some data has now been found that bed bugs can potentially transmit Chagas disease. Bed bugs have become epidemic in the nation and has been found in a variety of places, including some of the most famous hotels, because they will come in on the luggage, they will settle in on the place, you have people coming in and going all the time, and they may end up on the luggage and go home. There was one couple that went to a swanky New York hotel. I was remembering this from a couple years ago, reading it. They came home to Texas. It took them $140,000 to effectively and completely eradicate from their house the bed bugs. Okay? So, that being said, this is the conclusion of Chapter 12. I encourage you to go over the micro-assessment, future opportunities, and review the chapter. Next, viruses. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about bacteriophages, viruses, viroids, and prions. Lots of interesting information here. Here you see viruses. Now, these are special types of viruses. They are what are called bacteriaviruses or bacteriophages, and they're in attacking a bacterium. Now, obviously, there's a little color enhancement there so that they can be clearly seen. A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. A, a viruses exist to infect all domains, eukarya, bacteria, archaea. Viruses are also very small. They range from 50 to, to 500 nanometers. Therefore, they're much smaller than eukaryotic or even prokaryotic cells. And they must be seen by electron microscopy only. Now, at present, bacteriophages are being considered as a type of antibacterial therapeutic. Uh, the Russians and East, uh, Eastern Bloc nations did some serious research, and they're still working on that, developing various types of, uh, and selecting for particular types of phages that may be useful to help individuals infected with particular stubborn, drug-resistant bacteria. There are limitations to the therapy. Viruses are specific for different bacterial strain. Thus, multiple viral types need to be used uh, against the bacterial infections consisting of multiple strains. Although the viruses do not attack human tissue, they may be neutralized by the human immune system. 
culturing and purification of the viral culture extracts is required. And finally, we have to go through lots of clinical trials are required and eventually more market and public acceptance. A thorough education and marketing approach has to be pursued for this to be successful. So let's talk about the general characteristics of viruses. A virion is a virus particle. Outside of the host, it does not reproduce nor exhibit metabolic activity. A virion consists of a protective protein coat with a nucleic acid core. Now that nucleic acid core can be either DNA or RNA. If you look at the comparisons of human size of sizes here for cells, a human red blood cell is on the side there, massive, okay? And then next to it, even, ma even somewhat massive is E. coli, but then you've got those little viruses there. Everything from the polio virus to the T4, to the adenovirus, to the tobacco mosaic virus. Now, different viruses have different shapes based on the proteins that make up the capsid, as well as the means to package the nucleic acid. The different types of shape include isometric, which is composed of flat surfaces of equilateral triangles. In electron microscope studies, it may appear round or in some cases triangular. Helical, which gives the virus a filamentous or rod-like appearance, as you can see here. And then complex. Most phages are in this class. They have an isometric head with a long helical tail or sheath. Now, the tail may have other attachments. The structures include uh, the nucleocapsid, that's the viral capsid with the nu nucleic acid inside. And then we have capsomeres. Now, capsomeres, a protein, are subunits that make up the head. They're usually equilateral triangle in shape. In bacteria and animal viruses, not plant viruses, the virus has some type of attachment structure to attach to the cell. Uh, these are called attachment points or proteins. Uh, they may be called spikes. As they project from the tail structure, as you can see here, and um, or they may from outer structure of the animal viruses. Now, the thing that you notice here, and I come back to it, is they're the general types of viruses that we talk about for humans consist of naked and enveloped viruses. A naked virus consists of a protein capsid and the nucleic acid. That's it. The enveloped virus is a virus with an outer layer of a lipid membrane. Inside the membrane are matrix proteins. The attachment proteins project from the lipid membrane. The protein capsid exists uh, inside of the enveloped lipid membrane. Part of the reason I bring this up is when we talk about disinfection, and sterilization. Different chemicals will neutralize non-enveloped viruses, in other words, naked viruses. Others will be required for enveloped viruses. Okay? Now, when we talk about the viral genome, we're going to go into this a little bit more. The classification of human viruses. As you can see, it's based on nucleic acid, outer covering, family, the structure, okay? The viral genome consists of either DNA or RNA, but the DNA or RNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded, linear or circular. RNA is mostly single-stranded. A few have been found to be double-stranded. The type of nucleic acid is part of the criteria for viral classification. And as you can see, we've got the viral classification tables. We don't have it complete. It would be much, much longer. We're going to focus on those that really infect humans. Okay? And also the taxonomy is still evolving. And part of this is because we're still finding new viruses. The taxonomic classification is based on the genetic structure. In other words, DNA, RNA, whether it's double-stranded, single-stranded, single molecule, segmented molecule. And what I mean by segmented, to keep this in mind, uh, we're going to be dealing with this in influenza. Instead of one long continuous piece of nucleic acid, it's a bunch of different pieces. And they can be mixed and matched, depending. So keep that in mind. 
It also, the classification includes the virus particle structure, that is the shape, and the presence or absence of a viral envelope, so naked versus lipid membrane. Now here's even more confusion. If you remember we had confusion with trying to put uh, all the evolutionary history of bacteria, well when you get into viruses it gets even more interesting. Evolutionary relationships between families cannot be determined based on taxonomic relationships. There are 14 RNA containing virus families just for vertebrates alone. Seven DNA containing virus families again just for vertebrates alone. The International Committee on Viral Taxonomy developed a database and publishes a report describing key features, classification, and nomenclature of recognized viruses. As I said, this course we're only going to focus on animal viruses, okay, uh, for the most part. There are viruses that infect just shellfish. There are viruses that infect just um, insects. There are viruses that just infect fungi. So these things exist in all the different domains. We're just focusing on the stuff that might be medically cool, if you bear with me there. There are some naming rules, and I turn your attention. Um, if you look at, um, it says 344, which I don't know if that exists. I'm sorry, that's, that's an old notation there. If you look at 335 and 334, uh, there's a typo there, I'm sorry, in the notes. You have table 13.1, which includes some of the family names, etc. All the family names end with viridae, and it's italicized. The members of all families derive from a common ancestor as based on nucleic acid hybridization analysis. Names of families come from sources. They're based on the structure. They place the virus or they pl or the place the virus will first isolate. So let me give you an example. A coronavirus is shaped like a crown. That's where you get corona. Bunya viruses were named after Bunya verda in Uganda, Africa. This is where the virus was first discovered. Families contain many genus. Uh, genus names are composed as follows. The name ends with virus and is made up of a single word. The species name is the same uh, name of the disease that the virus causes, usually one or two words. And this is how the virus is referred to by the species name only, polio or poliovirus. Types or strains may follow the species name using a code of numbers and or letters. Now, I know you're sitting there going, that was kind of dry and a little bit boring. Bear with me, but I want to give you some idea about where these things came from. Groups of viruses defined by transmission routes. Uh, if you take a look at table 13.2. This gets a little bit more interesting. Remember that we talk about the portal of entry. How does an infectious agent get in? Well, when we talk about uh, grouping of viruses, this is not taxonomic designation, but it's based basically on the routes of infection, the portal of entry. So the groupings. Enteric is usually ingested by material contaminated by feces, so the fecal oral route. Most of that's intestinal, so that's enteric. Gastroenteritis, inflammation of the stomach and intestine. Note, diseases start with the GI tract, but spread to the rest of the body. They're called systemic disease. Respiratory. They enter the body through inhaled droplets and replicate in the respiratory tract. Those that start in the respiratory but then cause systemic disease are not considered respiratory. Zoonosis. These are diseases transmitted from animal to human or to another animal. This also includes uh, arthropods. Okay? So we get into arboviruses. R refers to the arthropod. Bo is arthropod born. These are called because they are transmitted via mosquitoes, ticks, sand flies. Sexually transmitted diseases can cause lesions of the genital tract, including herpes virus and papilloma virus. Those that uh, include those diseases transmitted sexually and then spread systemically, these include hepatitis and HIV virus. Okay? So let's go first to really what was the beginning when we talk about 
virus science or, or virus research, virology, and we had to focus in on the bacteriophages, and that was usually the first animal. I mean, they were doing some research with uh, uh, animal viruses, human diseases, but bacteriophages seem to be relatively straightforward to study and a lot less risk. Since viruses lack most of the metabolic mechanisms, its rep reproduction is solely dependent on cellular machinery. This is one of the major things to think about. Viruses, if you put them on your table right there, dry and all alone, they're going to do nothing. And how they take over a cell is dependent on what's in their genetic code. The genetic code will code for enzymes. The genetic code will code for reproduction of the virus. It may have to hijack most of the cellular functions that go on. Okay? So these are important parts to keep in mind. Now, some viruses lead to a rapid death of the cell, usually during the cell lysis. I refer you over to figure 13.4 right now. Other viral infections leave the cell minimally functioning while the cell continues to leak viruses from the plasma membrane. This is where it's going to just constantly keep releasing it, releasing it. It's almost like making the cell a slave. And what happens is it shifts the cell's uh, cellular processes to keep itself minimally alive, but at the same time pumping out those uh, new offspring of viruses. Understanding phage infections and replication in bacteria helps, but does not describe the complete picture of viral infections to human and animal cells. Now there are different types of viral infections, so let's go through them. The productive infection, the lytic phase, these are two types of scenarios. More virions are produced at the time that the cell, lice, that the cell lyses, it basically breaks open. The virus takes over all metabolic functions of the cell, so it hijacks everything, rams through as many new viruses made, the viruses exceed the volume of the cell, and the cell busts open. The other method is release of virions, but the cell doesn't lyse. This is where we call uh, the virions being extruded. The virus takes over only partial control of the metabolic uh, functions of the cell. Then we get into something called a latent infection. This is where the viral DNA integrates into the host cell, usually as a plasmid, but sometimes as part of the bacteria's cell chromosome. Latent, meaning hidden, is when you have no sign of an infection. As long as the viral genes are not expressed, the bacteria is a lysogen, and the cell is referred to as being in a lysogenic state. When the bacteria replicates, so does the phage DNA as well. So this continues. What causes it to shift over back to making new viruses? The viruses that integrate into the host bacteria cell are called temperate, that is controlled. There will be a, a situation, we're going to mention this briefly, of how you can flip it back over to the lytic phase. But let's focus in on the lytic phase for a few minutes. If you notice here, we talk about the lytic uh, phage T4 in E. coli. Phages that undergo the lytic process are called virulent. An example, T4, it's a double-stranded DNA phage. Only the viral DNA enters the cell, not any of the other proteins, either the protein code or any enzymes. So basically what you've got is just inject into it. The rest of the proteins that make up the phage stay on the outside, and you can see that in the uh, delivery. Excuse me. So, let's talk about the steps. One, attachment. The virus attached to the bacteria cell. It has to punch, punch through or puncture through the cell wall. Collisions by chance are, are what basically how the virions attach to them because the virions are not mobile. They don't flop around. The protein by fibers will attach to the cell wall. Once you have penetration, you have a lysosome enzyme located in the virion tail that begins to degrade the cell wall, allows the tail to inject the DNA into the cell, and the protein capsid remains outside. Now we've got to talk about transcription. 
DNA genes are coded for messenger RNA, which is translated into early proteins. So basically, something like a clock. Some of the genes are going to start early, others will be occurring afterwards. The early proteins, these are phage-induced proteins that include one enzyme to make the unusual pyrimidine, since viruses don't have cytosine, they make what's called hydroxymethyl cytosine. And that pairs with guanine. They also have one enzyme that degrades the bacteria cell DNA, breaks it up into pieces, stops it from continuing to reproduce. Other uh, enzymes will construct viral proteins. These will tend to be toward later on after the early proteins, the capsid, scaffold, others. Subsequent synthesis of viral components are timed for the proper assembly of the virion. Then we have the synthesis of the phage DNA and synthesis of the proteins. The phage DNA serves as a template for new phage DNA, as well as messenger RNA templates for viral proteins. So basically you have what's called vegetative reproduction. The mechanism of the phage reproduction, it's a similar process to transcription translation as in the bacteria cell. But keep in mind something. Where you're going to have the ribosomes provided, the ribosomes are provided by the bacteria cell. Then after you've got all these pieces together, you have to start doing the assembly. This is a complex multi-step process that includes packing the viral DNA into the capsid head, mostly a process of self-assembly. Some scaffolding proteins are used to assist in assembly, but they don't become part of the final virion. And then finally, boom, release. Later uh, stages of infection, the timing of the viral genes control the process, you have also viral lysozyme that is produced and digests the cell membrane and wall to release the virions. The burst size, in other words, how many viral particles, you know, it's almost like saying how many viral particles can screw in a light bulb? No, how many viral particles can explode a cell? Well, it depends on the virus itself, the phage itself, I should say. Lysis will usually occur when you get up to a, toward a maximum capacity. For the T4, that's about 200 uh, viruses or phages. Now keep this in mind. Hey, if one cell creates 200 viruses, you can imagine how quickly you're going to have this turnover where basically more viruses are made and more viruses are made and it's going to just ex basically destroy most of the other bacteria that might be in the area. But again, the virus is not going to swim anywhere. They have to be kind of carried by the currents or whatever. Uh, they're free floating. By the way, virolytic uh, single stranded RNA phages, they differ in the lytic process in the following ways. They attach to the bacteria cell via sex pili, remember? So therefore, they're only going to infect F plus strains of cells, okay, those bacteria that have the sex pili. They will rapidly replicate with a burst size of somewhere around 10 thousand virions. And also the RNA code supplies a special type of RNA polymerase that's required for replication of viral RNA. Now, what about phage, re phage replica, uh, replication in the latent stage? And I apologize, sometimes what happens is I, I, I say it interchangeably, phage and virus, but basically we're talking about a phage because it is a virus to bacteria only. Now, if you take a look here, a prophage is a viral DNA integrated into the host cell DNA, okay? Best example of that is lambda phage. Now, since these phages replicate best in actively metabolizing cells, if there is a low level of nutrients, it will enhance phage survival to become a prophage until the environment is more favorable for replication. So, bacteria starting to go low on the nutrients, basically it's just going to hide in the bacteria. The viral DNA once inside the cell becomes part of the bacterial genome through site-specific recombination. The viral DNA has similar sequences to bacterial DNA. For example, those genes for bio biotin synthesis or galactose metabolism. And it is at this site that the viral DNA combines. The process requires the bacterial enzyme integrase. Remember, they're not carrying, uh, viruses aren't going to carry a lot of proteins with them. They're going to be dependent on the cell for a lot of their uh, proteins in the beginning.
the viral DNA will produce a repressor protein. This blocks the excision process. So it blocks the expression of the enzyme excisase. Keep in mind excisase later on. Now the prophase can be excised from the bacterial DNA via the enzyme excisase. Uh-huh. Okay, now wait a minute. So first it shuts down excises. Yeah. But excises can be expressed and the lytic process started. Remember we talked about this? How does, once you've integrated your viral chromosome into the general bacteria chromosome, how do you reverse this? And how do you start making new, new viruses, new phages? Well, usually the activation of the SOS repair system, which yields an enzyme that destroys the repressor protein and thus triggers the production of excisate gene. This process is called phage induction. Inducing phage reproduction after the prophage exc excision. And you can see that on the diagram. Okay? Once you start that up, boom, you're going to start making new phages. The cell will lyse and the infection will spread again. Okay, what about phage immunity? When a prophage expresses repressor proteins, it blocks expression of other phage DNA sequences that subsequently enter the bacteria cell. So it's basically making sure it is the only phage, okay? Thus, the bacteria is resistant to subsequent reinfections by phages of the same strain as the present prophage. Okay, what about lysogenic conversion? Now, this is interesting. When the prophage exists, it may provide genes and thus new traits to the bacteria cell, including the production of toxins. Take a look at Table 13.3. Some properties encoded by prophages, lysogenic conversion, okay? If the prophage was removed or did not exist, that bacterial strain would not contain those toxins. And we're talking about toxins that cause the cholera, scarlet fever, hemolytic uremic syndrome, botulism, diphtheria, etc. okay? Now, what about, after we've gone through this, extrusion and filamentous phages? Filamentous phages, these are closely related group of phages that appear as long, thin fibers. They're single-stranded DNA phages that do not take over the metabolism of the cell. The bacteria cells are unhealthy, but they're still alive. The phage continues to extrude out of the cell. So basically you have this extrusion. Inside the inner, inner part of that phage is the phage DNA. Okay? And you have no lysis of the bacteria cell. The infected cells are called carrier cells. The virions attach via the sex pili to the bacteria cell. Therefore, the cell has to be, the bacteria cell has to be an F+. The phage DNA codes for the viral coat proteins that collect on the inside of the bacteria cell membrane. And the virions are extruded out as the virion DNA collects alongside the vir viral proteins. So basically, this extrusion is kind of like pushing it out from the side walls, pushing it out, pushing it out. And a case in point is M13 phage. And you'll see this, the viral DNA single, will be single-stranded and becomes double-stranded via the host cell enzyme inside of the bacteria cell, which is called the replicate form. And this is where we get into plus and minus. So think about it this way. You start off with positive. You part, start off with one strand. You've got to make the copy of it. So the negative strand becomes the template for RNA synthesis, while the plus strand becomes the template for negative strand copies for new virions. Okay? And that's all you really need to grab on there. And you can see this on 13.8. Now, next we're going to deal with is transduction. Wait a minute, didn't we deal with this with bacteria? Uh-huh. But this is the process to transfer pieces of bacterial DNA from one cell to another via a phage. This is a little bit more important because it can occur. This is horizontal gene transfer again. Remember that there are two types. Generalized, which performs by generalized transducing phages, or specialized, performed by specialized transducing phages. And I encourage you to review, if you're having some difficulty, pages 220, 221, back in um, chapter 8. Okay? 
and check out uh, figure 820. It'll help you. What happens is that you have fragments of bacterial DNA that get incorporated into the virion head, the nucleocapsid. The bacteria information crowds out other viral DNA. Now this is going to create a defective phage, which will leave the host cell, infect another cell, but the bacterial DNA, through homologous recombination, inserts into the new bacterial chromosome. But the viral DNA will not replicate. So basically what you've done is you had a defective virus transfer over a piece of DNA. It gets integrated. This DNA originated from another bacteria. It, but this gets integrated into the new bacteria. And so the new bacteria becomes transgenic. And yet you will not have the virus or the viral DNA replicate inside the bacteria. Okay, then we have specialized transduction, which occurs in basically uh, filamentous, that is temperate, um, temperate phages only, and spe uh, especially lambda phage. Okay, now in that, I'm going to move ahead here on my, my chart, but that's okay. Let me just describe this briefly. What happens is that only bacterial genes near the site where the prophage integrated can be transduced after the temperate phage DNA integrates into the bacterial DNA. When the DNA excises itself, it takes along a piece of the bacterial DNA. The new virions are released containing this incomplete viral DNA along with some of the bacterial DNA. And upon entry into a new host cell, the viral DNA and bacterial DNA integrate into the bacterial chromosome. The prophage is not going to excise, nor will reproduce new virions. This is used as a form of genetic engineering. Mostly, it's, though, it's been replaced by electrophoresis. Basically, it's a lot easier, instead of playing around with lots of phages, to basically take the cells, shock them so that they have pores formed in the cell membrane to force in the loops of DNA. Now here's another question. Bacterial cell defenses against phages. Why don't all phages infect all bacteria cells? So we have this one big homogeneous bacteria cell. This is where we get into host range, the range of cell types that a uh, pathogen can infect, in this case the phage. Various physical and biochemical factors on the host cells play a role in the limitations of host range of any phage. So what do we got? We've got uh, receptors. And uh, bacteria cells vary in the receptors present on the cell wall and cell membrane. Different species have different receptors. The phages may be selective in which type of receptor they're going to attach to, as well as the general structure on the bacteria cell that they attach. In other words, they may prefer cell walls of one type versus another. They may prefer cells without flagella. They may prefer cells with pili, etc. Two means to cause variation of receptor targets. Mutations of the receptors. Thus, a mutation in a large population of bacteria can yield a change in the receptor that results in the phage being unable to attach and infect the cell. OK. Some types of temperate phages alter the bacteria, the host cell surface, and thus may remove the original cell surface receptor. As such, the phage prevents further infection of the host cell by other phages. Now the next part comes back to some of the biotechnology we talked about before, and that is restriction modification system. And I do encourage you, if you need to, to review, to go to 342, as well as uh, 233, 234, figures 91 and table 92. We talked about restriction enzymes before. These are enzymes that cut DNA at unique sequences within the DNA. Each strain of bacteria has unique restriction enzymes. Now modification enzymes are enzymes that they modify. They don't cut, they modify. And what they modify are the nucleotide bases, usually by attaching things like methyl groups, etc. The methylated bases are not recognized by restriction enzymes and thus will not cut the DNA that has been methylated. This process is a means for the bacteria cell to protect its own DNA from degradation by its own restriction enzymes. If phage DNA enters a host cell and can get methylated before the restriction enzymes cut it up, 
then the foreign DNA can proceed to lytic or lysogenic phases. Now the next area I'm going to talk about is CRISPR. This is the hot area that everybody goes crazy over because it is one of the most promising means to insert new genes and correct genes and things like that and we are probably at the um, point where we're going to see a lot of things enhanced because of CRISPR. What is it? This process allows bacteria cells to retain a historical record of prior uh, phage infections by incorporating small segments of the phage DNA into the bacterial genome. It provides defense against future phage infections of the same genetic makeup. The fragment of phage DNA, called the spacer DNA, is inserted in the bacterial chromosome region called the CRISPR. CRISPR stands for clusters of regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats. The spacer DNA sequence is inserted into the CRISPR array and uh, is, it is transcribed into small RNAs called CR and RNAs. Okay? The CR RNA sequences bind to protein complexes called CAS, which stands for CRISPR associated sequences. This complex will destroy phage nucleic acid that complementary binds with the specific CR RNA sequences in the CAS CR RNA complex. Now that seems like a lot, but let me help you to understand it. What if, instead of letting nature introduce some of these CR RNA sequences, you did it in a laboratory on your own. You say, this is the RNA I want to introduce. What does it allow you to do? Knock out the uh, particular gene that you're looking at. Um, it is also a means to correct gene errors, has been found. And that's why the discoverers of it, or I should say the inventors of it, have exploded the biotechnology world and the genetic engineering world with all sorts of opportunities, including curing genetic diseases. And some experiments are actually going on right now. When we move from there to methods to study bacteriophages, and this is where you get a 1312. The method to detect the presence of a virus on a monolayer culture. Um, basically, you have the number of plaques, the clear areas created by the viruses killing cells, equals the number of viruses present. Okay, so each one of those plaques, this is on a lawn of bacteria. If there is an individual um, plaque, or excuse me, an individual phage there, it'll start basically killing off the bacteria around it because as it reproduces inside the bacteria, it produces more of the same type of phage, and they start spreading out okay, in a radial array, and this gives you an idea about the presence of the phages there. The assay uh, provides a means to estimate the uh, titer of the infectious dose of 50% of the exposed cells, which is the, called ID50, or the LD50, which is the lethal dose for 50% of the exposed cells. Now, that being said, we are going to start moving into another area. We're going to start focusing more on animal virus structure and replication. For some of you, you might be sitting there going, oh, really? Okay, so we're no longer with bacteria and viruses? No, but a lot of the principles can play themselves out in similarities in animal virus structure replication. Similar to phages in the sense of capsids, structural proteins, and nucleocapsids, protein outer coat containing either DNA or RNA. Nucleic acid is either single strand or double strand. Bacteria hosts and eukaryotic hosts differ in structure and therefore the viruses that infect them differ in reproduction structure and the genome. Major differences? Viruses with just a protein outer coat are called naked viruses. They have spikes of attachment proteins that project from the capsid surface and allow for attachment to the host cell. Okay, we've dealt with that before. Um, what they also do is that viruses with a lipid outer coat are called envelope viruses. In an envelope virus, the nucleocapsid contains nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, 
and has an outer coat with a lipid membrane that contains spikes or attachment proteins that attach to the host cell receptors on the outside of the membrane, while on the inside of the membrane exist what they call matrix proteins. Now some RNA viruses have one continuous strand of nucleic acid. You need to keep this in mind now again. Others have pieces, and each piece may not be identical. Influenza viruses, for example, have eight RNA molecules, and such viruses are called segmented viruses. Now, the shapes of viruses include isometric, which your most common arrangement exhibits an isocohedral symmetry, rod-shaped or helical, and pleomorphic, which are irregularly shaped. The complex-like phages that you see for bacteriophages does not exist for animal viruses. What you see here in figure 1313 is where we're going to go to next, animal virus replication. Some viruses develop a relationship with the host and live in a balanced means. They neither kill the host nor block viral replication. This is called balanced pathogenicity. No disease results, but if the animal receives the virus and has no immunity to the virus, then disease and even death to a new animal host may result. Infection. Okay, I'm going to go here now, and I'm going to look at the acute infection. Sorry about the interruption. What we have first with an animal virus is attachment. That's also referred to as absorption. It's based on the binding sites located on the spikes of the virus, which attach to the cell receptors. A lot of times these receptors are usually glycoproteins. Okay? So for acute infection, you have to keep in mind that because the virions must attach to specific receptors, frequently a specific virus will only infect a select type of cells or particular type of tissue within that host organism, and also within specific species. So this accounts for tissue specificity of viral infection as well as species specificity of viral infection. Also, viruses that cause lysis are usually, usually naked viruses. Viruses that do not cause lysis are usually enveloped. Now, after we've had the attachment, we've got to have entry, the penetration. And you can see this going on. And a lot of times it's either going to be by membrane fusion or by endocytosis. Naked virus, solely it's endocytosis. Envelope virus is going to be really either a fusion of the plasma membrane, cell and virus, via the specific fusion proteins of the virus, which after fusion allow the nucleocapsid to be released inside the cell, or an interaction with the outer viral, protein, viral membrane spikes and the cell receptors resulting in an endocytotic process, and the nucleocapsid forms a vesicle with the membranes, as you can see there. Now, Either way allows for delivery of viral proteins as well as viral nucleic acid inside the cell. This is particularly where animal viruses differ from phages. Phages are only delivering a viral nucleic acid. Here you get more viral machinery in the form of proteins along with the nucleic acid. Now targeting to the site of viral replication depends on the nucleic acid. Okay, And then we get also the issue of uncoating. This is where the nucleic acid separates from the protein coating. The replication of the nucleic acid and proteins depends on nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA. Um, and it also depends on whether it's single strand or double strand. The pattern of replication is similar to phages in that different proteins are timed to become available during different stages in the viral assembly and replication. Um, with the RNA virus, you have an RNA polymerase that uses viral RNA as the template. Also, depending on the virus size, the virus may supply some proteins involved in the replication of the viral genome. Again, as I said, phages don't. Generally, the larger the viral genome, the fewer host cell proteins are revolved, involved in replication. And this is an interesting point, because it then allows you to target for antiviral therapies. Now, if you sit there and say, you know, AZT and protease inhibitors and all that stuff for HIV, yeah. Because if the virus is bringing something unique to the package, that, that it's unique, a, you know, protease or something else like that, can be a target for drug therapy and thereby inhibiting viral replication or destroying the virus entirely. Let's move on. Finally, we get into maturation or viral assembly. Okay. 
and that is key. And as you can see, I, I brought up here uh, the viral replication strategies. Um, basically, you can see how the differences occur and where eventually the proteins are made. This is kind of important because in some cases, um, you have to first take over the machinery of the cell, make some proteins to keep the cell alive, then make more proteins that are going to be part of the viral um, progeny that are going to be made. Okay? Now, what about release? That depends on whether the virus is naked or enveloped. Okay? The cells die due to failure to sustain the cell metabolism and maintain cell metabolic proteins. Only viral proteins are being made. The cell dies and ruptures of the lysosomes. The cytopathic effects changes in the cells due to lysis of the cell. You can also have apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Many viruses trigger cell death by prior to the release of the viral particles. Now, envelope viruses are released via type of exocytosis, kind of like a budding. And they bud or bleb off the actual cell membrane. The cell membrane is going to be loaded with outer viral proteins, the spikes, and the inner nucleocapsid attaches and bubbles outward of the cell. Now, this is where we get into shedding of the virus. The infectious variants have to be have to exit the body. They've got to be shed so they can be out uh, passed out through feces, urine, genital secretions, blood, mucus, or saliva by the host. Usually, they've got to go out by some orifice or via some type of secretion. I want you to keep that in mind. And once shed, the virion must be picked up by another host. So that's the complete life cycle. When you compare bacteriophages to animal viruses, remember that phages do not insert any protein into the cell, whereas some animal viruses may include the capsid proteins, matrix proteins, as well as any nucleic acid-bound protein, such as reverse transcriptase for HIV. Okay? Now we're going to talk about the categories of animal virus infections. And what you saw there were the um, release of the viruses here. And you can actually see this lower image here, which is the virions budding off. Okay. Now I want to talk about virus infections. First off, you have acute infections. These are characterized by sudden onset of symptoms of a relatively short time span. Persistent infections. The infections continue with or without symptoms for years or the life of the host. Viruses are continually present in the body and are released from infected cells by budding. Persistent infection may or may not cause disease, but the infected person is still a source of infection for others. A case in point is uh, hepatitis B. You've had some cases where, or, or hepatitis C, where the individual may feel crappy for a bit, get better, but they're actually a carrier and they're going to be able to spread these viruses to others in certain situations. Okay. Late complications following an acute infection. The patient has a delay in appearance of the complications following acute infection. For example, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, SSPE. SSPE, the symptoms take 10 years to appear after an acute measles infection. Latent infection. Acute infection is followed by symptomless period and then reactivation of the disease occurs. Viral activity can be reactivated for a host of reasons. Stress, uh, exposure to certain other agents that may cause a uh, release, um, Examples include herpes simplex 1 and herpes simplex 2, as well as chicken pox, varicella. If you remember that they have the um, uh, shingles, uh, basically commercials for the uh, shingles virus and the shingle vaccine. Now we have to deal with the term provirus. This is a silent viral genome that does not integrate into the host cell chromosome. It is independent nucleic acid strand and it acts like a plasmid. And then we have to deal with the concepts of a chronic infection. After the initial infection, the virus production continues even if the symptoms of the disease are not present. Hep B, Hep C is an example, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. A slow infection. 
This is present in HIV, lentiviruses, and prions. Now, prions we'll get to in a little bit. The transmissible agent multiplies without resulting in disease symptoms until they cause a fatal infection. Complex infections, well, that's another situation. These are infections with more than one type of infection time course. And then, of course, we've got to deal with HIV and retroviruses. Reverse transcriptase is really an enzyme that makes a DNA copy using an RNA template. That's why HIV was so incredible. Um, it really uh, exploded the concept of retroviruses, which were kind of, he some people were somewhat hesitant in buying. But that this is a protein that will take RNA as a template and make a DNA copy. That copy may become a prophage and integrate into the host chromosome. This enzyme, though, has no proofreading activity, and therefore it's prone to create copies of DNA containing errors. That's why you were having also a problem with treating of HIV, because you had all sorts of different versions of HIV in the same patient, and it was because of these errors. Okay? And it made uh, treating HIV very difficult, because a lot of times you would get the drug stopping certain strains, but not others. Also, you've got to consider the concept of the polycystronic messenger RNA. They make polyproteins that require a protease, protein-cutting enzyme, to free the protein units. You see this with HIV, but they've started to see this with several other viruses. And then we develop proteinase inhibitors. This is a new class of drugs that stops the cleavage of the polyprotein by inhibiting the protease and enzyme, and that causes, uh, stops the viral replication. Protease inhibitors are part of the cocktails that are used now to treat HIV-infected patients, and that is why they have had uh, longer survival rates. Now let's talk about something else here. Um, I, I have here examples of persistent infections, and then we're going to go from here, we're going to go into the next area, which you can see here. This is the example of a situation where you have the virus uh, for cold sores, okay? And basically, it gets into the sensory cranial nerve of the nerve ganglia near the brain and becomes latent for a long period of time. Then later on, you have the reactivation and you end up with cold sores. That said, we have to deal with the other biggie, and that is the virus-induced tumors. Since the 70s, they have suspected that viruses cause cancer. Yeah, but it took a long time to understand and prove it. Tumor or neoplasm is a term, meaning a swelling from an abnormal growth of cells. Benign tumor, the, gro the growth remains in a defined region of the body. Metastasizes, this is a malignant tumor that spreads to other parts of the body. Uh, there's a typo there, but sorry about that. Cancer denotes a life-threatening tumor. Oncogenes are genes that cause a tumor cell to turn into a cancer. Proto-oncogenes, a type of gene that is involved in tumor for formation. Tumor formation, if you take a look on 1318, what happens is that oncogenes can overrule a cell lifespan or alter the function of a cell as it turns into a tumor. Mutations usually act on proto-oncogenes to activate them. Some viruses contain proto-oncogenes in their genome, and these genes become active when the viral DNA gets integrated as a prophage into the host cell chromosome. Now, the other issue we've got to deal with is viruses and human tumors. Some DNA uh, viruses can cause tumor formation. Okay? These include papilloviruses, herpeviruses, Karposky sarcoma is caused by a herpes virus. Retroviruses HTLV1 have been found to integrate into the host cell as a prophage and then cause a rare form of leukemia. Human papillomaviruses, at least 15 different types, are associated with the development of cancers. Now, I'm going to talk about viral host range issues as it relates to genetic mixing, and this relates to influenza. I'm taking extra time on this because, to be honest with you, you need to know this cold, fast, and hard. 
You really need to know this content. First off, viruses can infect select tissues or even just one select species. What determines the range of the viral infection is the need to attach to a host cell and the cell factors necessary for viral replication. Therefore, usually any changes in the attachment proteins of the spikes can enhance or limit viral replication. Keep in mind also that changes to the outer coat, coat uh, spikes may enhance the means for a virus to evade the host's immune defenses. Everybody got that one? Good. Now, what am I talking about here? Let's start talking about how we end up with, basically, in the end you'll see this, so many different influenza strains year after year after year that are different and some of them get deadly. Phenotypic mixing. This is a mixing of protein coats when two different viruses infect the same cell. Notice in the top there. They have different nucleic acids. They start synthesizing uh, different protein coats. Okay, So this is going to result in viruses with different protein coats as compared to their genetic codes of the nucleocapsids. After one generation, the virus returns to the protein codes coded for by the viral genome. Genomic exchanges in segmented viruses. Now look, remember segmented viruses. Instead of one continuous strand, whether it's DNA or RNA, most of the time you're going to see this with RNA, you're going to have pieces. Okay, And this is well known in influenza. They found that there are several other viruses that do the same darn thing. Okay, What do we have here? It's due to the mixing of the segments of the two viruses that simultaneously infect the host cell. The viruses produced may basically contain a mixture of traits from different mixes of viral genome segments. This can create new combinations of attachment proteins, and this is known as antigenic shift. Now, antigenic shift is different from antigenic drift. You've got to keep that in mind. Antigenic drift is basically minor mutations. Antigenic shift, think of it as a shift, is much more intense. Slight changes in the attachment uh, protein coats, that's drift. It's due to mutations. Big changes, that's antigenic shift. Now, with drift, the coat proteins, the antigens may shift and may evade uh, the host immune system. Okay, um, And it depends on what type of mutation th that occurs here. But let's see this from the perspective of influenza. Okay, The virus contains eight segments, eight RNA segments. Okay, Glycoproteins, hemagglutinin, and neuramidase are changed by the virus creating new strains and new intensities of virulence. Hemagglutinin. This allows for the virus to attach to specific receptors on ciliated epithelial cells. Hmm, where do you see ciliated epithelial cells? Let's see, in the trachea, in the respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract. Yeah, and this will initiate infection. Neuraminidase. This is the enzyme that allows for the spread of the virus by breaking down the attachment of the cell receptor to hemagglutinin inside and that's during entry, and then going outside, that's during viral release of the virus. If you mix the RNA strands, this is going to create new strains of influenza. Now, antibodies that bind to the hemagglutinin will inhibit the infection, but if you've never experienced this new combination, oh boy. New strains of influenza can be created by antigenic shift, new RNA segments combina com, uh, combinations. For example, including between humans or humans and swine, chicken, duck, etc. That's why avian influenza is terrifying. Because remember, you're not just dealing with, well, they've grown a whole mess of chickens or, and we're going to have to destroy them all. Or they've grown a whole mess of ducks and we've got to destroy them all. They also get carried by migratory birds all over the world. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand here. Okay, The biggest factor uh, when they had the last scare, which was 2009, was holy cow, this avian influenza is not just in the uh, open markets for ducks and chickens in the Chinese uh, food courts. 
It's also in huge farms and mega areas, but it's also now being carried by migratory birds all over the world. They were getting quite concerned because if it jumps from chickens to humans, it becomes very virulent, especially in cases where antigenic shift has been there. The humans have never experienced this type of influenza and it can create a lot of uh, serious health problems. Antigenic drift also plays a role because you're going to get point mutations in the hemagglutinin. This is going to create resistance to antibody binding. Okay, now let's start moving toward a final wrap up here. How do we cultivate and quantitate animal viruses? First way, real simple, cell culture. See, if you grow the cells, you're going to basically create the conditions to cultivate the virus, which will grow inside the cells and then of course they lyse the cells but then you're able to then move forward now uh, and study the virus primary cell culture this is cell culture prepared directly from tissues of animal established cell lines these are cell cultures prepared from existing cell lines the cells can be grown under a proper culture medium it's just like growing bacteria except you just have specialized medium that allows for the growth of cells whether it's respiratory cells epithelial cells uh, kidney cells I used to do some of this at Mass General and grow different types of cells on these petri dishes or culture dishes okay and they will grow on a monolayer a single layer of cells adhering to the bottom of the culture plate now most cell lines are derived from tissues that can multiply replicate 50 to 100 times and then they die most cell lines are derived from tumor cells that are called immortal that is they replicate unlimited amount of times and never die for example HeLa cells the purpose of growing cells is to grow the viruses in culturing the cells, the viruses that reproduce inside of the viruses can be obtained. The resultant burst cells, uh, excuse me, the resultant basically is that you're going to have the cells burst. Uh, they're going to have the uninfected cells. You can remove those, usually through centrifugation and filters. And then you're going to have this remaining culture fluid that's going to contain a high content of virions. And tissue culture is used to culture the viruses and is used as a means to detect the presence of certain viruses. If the cell is infected with a virus, it can change the shape, act like a cancer cell, grow in multiple layers, act in other ways. Okay. Uh, you might see this if you take a look here. If you look above, you've got viral infection on the cells in the culture. The, you had healthy cells on the top, you've got infected cells with a bunya virus on the bottom and you see how they all kind of like bubble up and round up etc and uh, basically this is a situation you know uh, where, where those cells are infected with a virus it's going to alter their, their performance it's going to alter their biochemistry it's going to alter their cell function and in many cases the cells are going to die also okay now you also have the plate assay, which we talked about a while back. And the, uh, oh, and by the way, the nice thing is by culturing these viruses, you can extract the fluid. You can examine them by an electron micrograph. These are calciviruses. And by the way, notice that there's some that ones look like shadows. They're kind of like empty. Well, those are empty capsids. The ones that are full capsids are the ones that are kind of whitened, like whitened snowballs. Okay. Now, plaque, plaque, plaque assays. The method to detect the presence of virus in, virus in a monolayer culture, the number of plaques or clear areas. Remember that we did plaque uh, assays using phages for bacteria. Well, you can do the same thing. Um, basically, the number of plaques, clear areas created by viruses killing the cells on a monolayer culture of, of cells equals the number of viruses present. Based on the one virus leads to one plaque idea. And this is great. It provides you with information about estimating the titer of the infectious dose 50, which is known as ID50, for exposed cells, or the lethal dose, which would be LD50. And as I mentioned, you can also count them by EM. Electron microscopy provide another means to physically count the number of viruses present in a given sample. You've got quantal assays, which is basically doing a dilution of the virus preparation that is applied to a cell culture. The titer of the virus, that is the concentration, is the dilution at which 50% of the inoculated hosts are infected or killed. You also have hemagglutin, glutination. Now, if you take a look here at this diagram, which shows you some hemagglutination, very straightforward. 
Keep in mind that viruses have attachment points, more than one, on each single virus. So they can basically cause a clumping. If you were using red blood cells, you can end up having the red blood cells clump up as the viruses start attaching to multiple red blood cells. And then you do this in a quantitative way. Uh, you measure the dilution, which gives you an idea of the concentration. You also have controls there, positive and negative, you know, those with and those without, that with blood and not without. And it gives you a great way to do counting of the viruses. Furthermore, I encourage you to review the case presentation and the microassessment. Now let's talk about plant viruses. Now this is infec infection due to viruses that do not bind to the cells, but they must enter the plant cells. Usually it's through wounds to plants. The best studied one was uh, the first one, the tobacco mosaic virus. But once inside the plant, the virus is spread via cell-to-cell -cell gaps in the cell walls called plasma desmata. Also, transmission can occur via insects. Now, there are three means in which you're going to have viral transfer by insects. External, temporary transmission. The virus is present on the insect mouth parts. Circular transmission, the virus circulates but does not multiply inside of the insect. And then active multiplication of the virus inside of the insect. And as I said to you before, tobacco mosaic virus is one of the best studied viruses, well over 100 years of studies. And they actually, you basically can scratch up a virus leaf and pour this liquid on it that contains the tobacco mosaic virus and see later on the virus plant, excuse me, the uh, lesions on it, as you see here on 1323, okay? And you can see some of those dots or spots there. That's the actual. And you also see some of the uh, leaf curling that's occurring. The lower one is a wheat plant showing yellowing caused by wheat streak mosaic virus. So all of those streaks. And that is a disease that has to be considered. Now, the next thing we're going to move into, uh, and before I leave, I did want to show you this really cute picture. This is the tulip with symptoms resulting from a viral infection. Wherever the pigment is lacking, and the pigment being the red, that's where those parts of the developing petals were infected with the virus. Now, some people who are aficionados of flowers, etc., would say that's the coolest thing around. Okay, to each his own. But let's go and move into another area, and that is viroids. These are found only in plants. They're small RNA loops that are resistant to nucleases. They range somewhere between 246 to 375 nucleotides. Now keep in mind, you see where it's marked PSTD? Those are those tiny little loops there. Uh, that's the uh, potato um, basically that is the potato uh, it's a potato infectious virus. And I can't remember what it was at the time of me, but I remember this earlier. And these little loops, if you notice, are quite smaller compared to a T7 DNA. The interesting thing is that this single viroid is capable of infecting a cell, replicate autonomously within the susceptible cells, and um, there are no other virions or viroids that are required for replication. Oh, yes. The PSTD stands for potato spindle tuber, tuber virus. And basically it distorts and warps the shape of the potatoes. There are other diseases, kadang kadang, citrus escurus, uh, cucumber pale fruit, and chrysanthemum stunt. Now it mostly affects plants, but there's always been the question, do we ever have the possibility it might infect uh, animals or humans? And no one's really sure at this time. The next area is an area that I'm doing some research in right now, and that is on prions, which are proteinaceous infectious agents. They are the causative agent of transmissible, spongiform, and cephalophiles. They are these are neurodegenerative disorders. In other words, it causes the brain to become uh, sponge-like in appearance because the cells start dying out. Uh, it's interesting to note that prions are not inactivated by ultraviolet light, meaning that they do not have any nucleic acid at all. They replicate by interactions with similar healthy proteins. They convert healthy proteins to prion by altering the tertiary structure of the protein. 
And if you remember your protein chemistry, you've got the lineup of beads of amino acids, and then they go into a secondary shape, and then they go into a tertiary shape. But when they go into that tertiary shape, they're supposed to be fixed and shouldn't be changing. But with prions, they can distort and create a second type, which causes them to then begin to form these long uh, strands of distorted prion proteins, which can then lead to the death of the neurons. The other big problem, they can jump species. You probably have heard of the mad cow outbreak that occurred. The mad cow outbreak occurred by basically what happened is this. If you compare the United States to Europe, particularly the UK, the way they produce beef. In the United States, we use high protein supplements with lots and lots of grains. To get the protein supplements for cattle in Europe at the time, what they did was they started to recycle uh, basically sick animals. They had sheep that had a disease called scrapie, and literally what it does is that once it starts having this protein-based deterioration of its brain, it starts getting into very self-destructive habits like scraping up against wood posts, etc., until literally the wool is rubbed off, the skin is rubbed off, and they have open wounds. The animal is killed, it is then rendered into a protein meal. Problem? That protein meal contained the prions. These were fed to the cows. They eventually developed bovine spongiform encephalophily, otherwise commonly known as mad cow disease. In that situation, the cows would start to lose balance, have a difficulty uh, keeping themselves upright on their legs, and they would be listless. And basically what was happening was they were very badly infected with the prions and the brain was deteriorating. Problem there, it can be transmitted to humans and about 140 documented clinical cases have been found when mad cow meat got transmitted uh, and consumed by humans that led to uh, what's called um, kronzfeld jakob disease. kronzfeld jakob disease, this is the variant, variant they called it, was a human det deterioration of the brain, spongiform encephalophily. Now there are several forms of uh, inherited prion-based diseases, kritzfeld jakob gerstmann strahler Schrenker syndrome, fatal familial insomnia. And why they differ is basically where the prions start causing deterioration in the different parts of the brain. One other type of prion-based disease was called Kuru. This was based in New Guinea by certain tribesmen. What they would do is when someone died, they would hand the brain to various people of the deceased, some would take small pieces and consume them. When they stopped that tradition, the Kuru disease stopped. Now, there are other types of disorders. We have chronic wasting disease in mule deer and in elk in the West, and that is causing some concern. The big problem that you have to understand right now is this. Prions and you can see how the spongiform lesions are forming there, are basically almost impossible to destroy. They are resistant to heat and chemical treatments. There was a documented case of 13 cases of kreutzfeldt jakob that was basically caused when a doctor used uh, stereotactic neurosurgical tools to do brain surgery on an individual that had kreutzfeldt jakob they went through the normal glutaraldehyde decontamination and used those same instruments on 13 more patients. All of them got the same disease, meaning that the prions were able to withstand the decontamination procedures necessary. And what has been found is that you have to literally have to use something like 10 molar sodium hydroxide at very high temperatures for over an hour, which basically destroys and renders most equipment useless. They can survive on stainless steel. They can survive on barnyard equipment. They can survive in the soil, it's been found recently. And that is getting to be a serious concern. So feed, water sources, they have been found to survive in the soil for extensive periods of time and can actually be shed as infective agents from water that washes through that same soil. They can be shed in saliva, urine, feces, and decomposing, uh, decomposing animal carcasses and still remain infectious. 
So the big problem now is how do we deal with it? And the answer is nobody is 100% sure. They do know that they have to treat it with severity and, and seriousness. Um, at present, there are no known pharmaceutical uh, um, treatments for this, uh, for the prions. There, are, there is some hope for a decontamination approach. Uh, there were some scientists from the USG, United States Geological Service, that found that certain lichens, yeah, it goes back to lichens you learned earlier, seem to have certain serine proteases that can destroy prions. But nobody has gone any further with that, with that research yet. Um, the basic principle that you need to be aware of is that when in contact with material from an infected patient, you have to treat it with the most utter seriousness to prevent contamination yourself. Okay? And as you can see here, this is what you have. The PRC is the, is the normal prion protein. The, PRP, the PRPSC is the prion uh, disturbed one, and it starts transforming other proteins. And as you can see, it moves downward until basically you start forming these fibers that eventually will accumulate in the neurons and lead to the destruction of the neurons. So where do we go from here? Basically. I encourage you to review the future opportunities as well as the summary of this particular chapter. And we will continue next week. And I want to thank you very much for your time. Have a nice day.